Okay. Does that mean we're just starting the recording? No. Okay. Uh, the Pratt Center in New York for Applied Research in the Department of Sustainability and Environmental Justice. Alessio also teaches and has taught at a number of universities, including the East China Normal University in Shanghai and universities in Bologna, Milan, Turin, and Pavia. He's published a couple of books, one titled Appropriate Technologies for Architecture in Emergency Conditions, and another entitled Vernacular and Local Material. And really interestingly and importantly, partly grabs me, is uh, Alessio has done an enormous amount of important social justice architecture in difficult and contested contexts. He built an elementary school in the Bedouin village of Jahalin al Khan al Amar in East Jerusalem, an elementary school in Wadi Abu Hindi in East Jerusalem, a daycare center and a women's center in the Gaza Strip, a removable clinic in the West Bank of Palestine, and a reconstruction of an elementary school in Qalqilia uh, on the West Bank of Palestine. All of this between 2009 and 2016. Our second shop talk tonight. I'm doing both introductions together, but um, our second talk is from Grace Funston, and Grace's talk will be is entitled Death and the Dominia, the Influence of Erotic Elegy on Latin Verse Epitaphs. Grace is the Emmeline Hill Richardson Arthur Ross Rome Prize Fellow in Asian Studies and a PhD candidate in the Department of Classics at the University of Washington. Grace is completing a PhD. Uh, at oh, um, no, she's completing her PhD entitled In Versus Faccio, Rewriting Augustan Elegy in Latin Epitaphs. She has a BA from Georgetown University and is an alumna of the Classical Summer School here at the American Academy. And a lot of people do the Classical Summer School and then come back as well. So this is wonderful. Uh, her scholarly and academic interests are wide ranging and interdisciplinary. She focuses on Latin epigraphy, Greek and Latin elegy, illusion and intertextuality, gender and sexuality, and classical reception. Uh, we had an introduction to Grace's multifaceted and very deep knowledge of the ancient world when she and John Izzo uh, gave us a really wonderful tour of the inscriptions in the Cortile last week. Uh, Grace is already the recipient of a number of very impressive grants and fellowships, uh, including one from the Society of Scholars Summer Dissertation Fellowship from the Simpson Center for the Humanities, and a number of University of Washington fellowships, including the Philip and Estelle DeLacy Dissertation Fellowship from the Classics Department. Grace is already in the thick of publishing, and she has May a butcher this side de fixa, an examination of Ovid's magical language in Herodotus 21, forthcoming from the classical journal. And then under invited and under consideration is a chapter in the Rutledge Companion to the Reception of Ancient Greek and Roman Gender and Sexuality. And that chapter is entitled The Poet, Puella, The Penis, Impotence, and Elegiac. Elegiac failure, Maximianus, and Ovid. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. So thank you both. And I turn it over to Alessio Batista. Thank you, Marla, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you to everybody. So I'm going to start. Ah, yeah, I, I'm going to. I'm, I'm, I'm not reading, so I can bring a piece of Italy in uh, an academy, okay? <laughs> and uh, through my, you know, huge grammar mistake, maybe. But let's start the first problem. <laughs> What's going on now? Uh, let's see. Okay. okay. So. Uh, how we are going to do what we do, and uh, why we do what we do. Why basically are these data? Okay, 
these data now are increased, so we are in a quite worse situation. And I think that as architect, we really must make something to improve the, the situation uh, everywhere. So as uh, how we do it as architect, we we focus on sustainability. The sustainability that must always be um, focused on the three pillars of sustainability. There are not just environmental sustainability, but social and economic must work together to improve each project that we are going to do. So how we do it? I'm going to show you some projects. The first project is in Iraq. The city is uh, Mosul. We just entered just after the ISIS occupation. So as you can see, we are in the historical center, one of the most beautiful cities that I ever seen in my life. That river is the Tigris. So we are exactly the cradle of the civilization, you know? And uh, this is what's going on right now. So everything was destroyed. Mm -hmm. You know, this is uh, uh, a school, and it looked like uh, a target. And uh, we do it, European and the US Army. So, but this is another issue, and we are going to chat about it in another situation. And I mean, how we are going to do it? Uh, as architect, we try to go more in deep as uh, possible in the places where we work, uh, according with the culture of the place. So we start always a participatory process. We work with institution, with uh, with um, the professor, the teachers that then have to work where in the place where where, um, where that we are going to design with the parents. Of the children and with the children. So we try to have an overview of the situation where we, we work and design together um, the school. Then, of course, we go as much in deep as possible in what is the climate issues. Okay, so how we can design a project in that peculiar place, in that peculiar climate. So all the microclimate that we, all the elements, the factors, the data that, we, that we, we can collect, we use to design. So the design is the, the output of our, our uh, you know, research. Then of course, we work a lot on the cultural issues. In this case, cultural for us, uh, we, we, we was synthesized in uh, the idea of a patio typology, which respond very well to the climate issues and cultural issues, the meaning of the privacy of this peculiar culture. So the patio, I mean, starting from the empty space, so we before start from the empty space to build around of it, the building. So it's a kind of reverse approach. And then, of course, we analyze how, where is the facade that could be overeating. And so we are going to respond through architectural tools to all these uh, questions. So, for example, the south is in, in that side. Here, the temperature is quite high, but in the winter, it's quite cold. So we have to respond to both the, the situation. And so we, we work with the scream, with um, uh, scream with uh, you know element that uh, in the culture is called uh, machinaria, for example. And so always maintain privacy and you know make possible entering ventilation. All we are always in this balance. Okay, I say patios. I don't have any you know any ah yeah. These are the two patio, and we give a themes for each patio. So this patio is more institutional it is the water patio. And through, we build it in, um, through a low tech, uh, from the top, a low tech point of view, a kind of cooling system that to make more comfortable this, this environmental. So patio, shadow, vegetable garden for the children. 
So as we can, as we do in the, in the academy, so we grow up the, the vegetable and then the green patio, which is a kind of uh, outdoor classroom. So it's a place where they can uh, enjoy. This is the fountain, the water patio. In the water patio, we design a, a, a fountain, low tech fountain, we, where we collect the rainwater, uh, reuse the rainwater, and the hot hail enter. And so it's a kind of you know cool system, cooling system, but very low tech. This is the playground, playground yeah, yeah, patio, and this is the patio that we saw. We, I see that this facade will be very overheating, and so we design a ventilated facade. So we calculate all these holes in a way that uh, the ventilation can, you know, constantly move. And so with no system, no plan system, we can get a very comfortable environmental. And this is the final result. And now this building is under construction. And so, as you can see, we respect the privacy the culture, the, the, of the culture where we work. We work with this uh, masharabia, which is, uh, you know, a way, as, again, to don't see inside, but have a ventilation. These are the patios, okay, more institutional. Here we have the professors, the, um, the director, and this is a place where also you can have a chat with the, with the parents. This is the outdoor classroom, and this is the playground. Again, I, uh, let me show uh, other projects that, that work in the same way. I mean, what I, I would like to underline is the, the way out environmental data and cultural data were merging, and the output will be a uh, shape architecture, but each chooses its uh, focus on it. We are in a Gaza Strip, so very, very tough situation, situation where you, we don't have a way to, to find building materials, you don't have a way to work, you have to be very, very careful. And we work in the worst part of Gaza Strip, the north, where you have areas gate, where, you know, the tank enter when the war is tougher. So we build something just with the local material. We try to use all the sustainable principles, the passive sustainable principles that we can use. And so we collect the rainwater because the water is a huge problem. And uh, we reuse the bathroom water and uh, we um, use the double roof so we don't need uh, isolation. And uh, we just use the earth that we dig in the place where we are. So the building is partially hypogeo. And then we use the same techniques that is usually used for the work. So for the trinchy. I don't know if it's the right word. But, and so we use exactly the same, but we change again the symbolic value of our project is quite important. We change it, see a symbol of bad things is something very important for the community. So we build a kindergarten in this case, a women's center. So that became the place where the women and the children can be safe. So we build it, also the barber wear. I mean, we use all the elements that are quite easy to find in a war zone. And we just change totally the point of view and how we can use it. Then we use the same earth for the plastering. So we really try to born to make grow up the building from the place. So we just use all the characters, the, character, the characteristics of the place. The internal uh, facade is built with earth adobe, with earth blocks made on the place. And uh, we did the, the first photovoltaic system in uh, Gaza Strip. And uh, again, this inclination is uh, a reference. So we try to, again, working with the symbolic value and we try to reproduce the Bedouin tents. We are in a Bedouin village in this case. And so that is the, the shape, but it's also the best shape to collect as much rainwater as possible. And it's also the shape to get the, the right inclination to produce as much energy as possible from the photovoltaic system. So we always try to build a matrix and get the best result 
in terms of aesthetic and functional, cultural and environmental. This is uh, we calculate uh, the you know the Bristol A system in a way that we take advantage about the natural light. So the natural light, the right amount of quantity is, is not something that can cause problems to the children, for example. And this is the patio, okay? The big tank is in the first part, and then we have a kind of bath where we clean the, the, the water. Now there was, uh, I mean, the, the plants, a lot of plants, is a clean system of water, and then a playground in the last. And this is what I'm, I'm saying. Now it's a very iconic uh, um, landmark in this uh, little town. Now we have a, a white roof, which is the uh, best cover to go over overheating the the, the 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 school, and then uh, you know the wall that is a kind of stretch from the earth. It's really grew up. Unfortunately, this building was destroyed. In the last war that uh, was in uh, 2014. So the Israeli army just entered and uh, destroyed everything. I'm quite proud about this school because uh, it presents two bombs, three, sorry, three bombs, but then just they enter with the caterpillar and uh, just destroy it. Uh, but we really, really believe believe in the you know in the power of the education to fight in race also the fundamentalism uh, which is quite you know present uh, in a place like Gaza Strip and so we come back and we build another school another kindergarten which is we we use other techniques so we can leave a, a new a new know-how a new you know skills. To build themselves because a lot of these buildings are built, you know, in a self construction, true self construction principle. So we build with the community and we try to, to, to teach some different techniques. Okay, so in this case, again, we take a reference of resistant building. They, I mean, they use a lot of arch and dome, and so we choose a, a boat, you know. Uh, which is something that they, they use a lot. We introduce uh, these uh, stabilized earth compress block, which are quite good in terms of resistance. And then we build all the building. And then we, we work also with a green roof, which is quite good in, uh, in, with, in this uh, temperature. And these are the walls. Again, we try to work with the symbolic value of these places. And, uh, the reference was the dune of the desert. We are quite near to this kind of and uh, environmental. These are the classroom, which are quite scalable. We can uh, we can rebuild it in an easy way. So it's a very easy construction system that they can reproduce. They can work on it. This is the, the other side, and this is what I say. I it is a kind of reproducing the. The dunes, uh, the I mean something that is very near to the local culture. So something that uh, I mean, we don't want to go and just you know make something that is good for us, uh, come from our background, but you know we want to do something that could be a real, uh, you know, uh, public building for the community where we work. Okay. And this is the, the building. But uh, now uh, I am I'm, I'm show you some again places uh, where the crisis is quite strong. But uh, we are in crisis. Crisis. We are in the crisis. The first the first time in the in the twenty nineteen, the Guardian starting to talk about climate crisis. We are not anymore in a change. In climate change issues, but we are in a real crisis. And we talk about it from the 1968, you know, in a, just nearby in Academia dei Lincei in Rome, a, a group of persons, quite, quite you know, smart person, educators, economics, uh, you know, scientists, they start to to work on uh, this uh, wonderful and you know 
very good work that is you know still quite on on day half day and um, and they say what where we are going okay and they say in a very very good way and that's happened in the 1972 uh, 72 and uh, everything was uh, almost said okay then in 2014 uh, another scientist uh, in um in Melbourne try to verify with data the models that uh, the, the group of the limit of growth uh, show us and everything was correct so you know we have the tools the skills to to react to it but now we are a kind of too late this is another paper in uh, 2009 that showed that for at least uh, three indicators that define the borders, the borders, the boundaries that we can't cross to have the world, to maintain the world as it is. And for three of these indicators, we just cross the line. No way to come back. I mean, we are in a real crisis. Again, the, the the record the gap record that is uh, for, for those producer from the 19 from 2019 that show how full uh, carbon um you know the, the fossil energy source we use uh, show very well the point where we are uh, you know and the goals that we should have to maintain the situation where we are in this case our goals for the COP, from the cop 21 were you know less the 45 percent but we get plus 60 so and the 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 cop 26 is not comforting okay we still are producing this fossil fuel production okay and these are institutional source okay un so mm, are not you know some somebody weird some some weird scientists that are saying us you know fake news are all sharing they are everything is true okay okay if you if we get the, the two degree this is more or less what's going on and we are in this path now we are you know exactly going in, the, in this direction so i really think that um, as uh, us as intellectual we have a huge responsibility to be part of this uh, revolution i don't know how can i call it and as architect uh, we are really involved on it i mean in, in europe uh, these values are still more are still bigger in uh, in uh, in Europe, more or, less, more or less, we are around the forty five percent of uh, CO two emission, depending from uh, the building and construction uh, system. So we must do something, and uh, and I think that we can start from you know what we are uh, from the design. Now we just give up as architect uh, under my point of view. And we just, you know, through a, a kind of narcissism and, you know, a huge growing of ego of my colleagues, we, we just think about shape and we just leave to the heating and cooling system the responsibility to build something sustainable. Okay, so I really believe that we have to, to start into the, you know, the, the, I mean, the vernacular as the synonym as a you know, way to define the design that grew up from from the place where we were from the culture where we were from the environmental issues from the social and economical so i really want to stress the power of innovation of this kind of architecture okay and i really believe that there could be a way that could be show an aesthetic 
and form, we can substitute the model with the contemporary architecture, and we have what I'm talking about. You know? These are principles that we must and can become aesthetic, can make became the shape of the like, architecture that we do, do we should do in our age. We are not alone in this process. Okay. Uh, I saw I saw a lot of uh, I, I found, I mean uh, this is what on my reference and uh, we are going to see a couple of uh, expositions that uh, work on it. I mean uh, with other goals because we are in a in a in the middle of fascism uh, uh, age, but uh, I think that Pagano, Giuseppe Pagano, in this case uh, uh, he worked with Guarnero, uh, but Pagano is quite a huge architect. Uh, I mean that he was killed in a camp of concentramento, so he worked in with the fascism, but that he, I mean, but this is another issue, <laughs> okay? And uh, they they organize, they uh, make a lot of research about uh, what we, we can call vernacular architecture. So they define. Uh, all the typology and the way how you can design in the peculiar places with peculiar environmental context and peculiar culture. And they do it, uh, they travel around all the Italy and define for each region, region how you, you, should, you should design. And that was uh, esposed in the Milano Triennale, nella, nella Sesta Triennale in the 19th. 36, which was a, a quite wonderful exposition. It, it, it was a part of this exposition. So then more, more recent, more, more recent in the 1964, there is another exposition that uh, emphasizes that focus on it and, uh, uh, and work on how we can, as architects, learn from architecture without being green. And is a huge, a huge amount of knowledge that uh, we can uh, we can found in this exposition, exposition too. And uh, I'm quite comforting because now also the the cultural mainstream is starting to 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 take care about it, about, it, about it. This is the last book by Julia Watson, which is an anthropologist uh, teaching in Harvard, and she make. Uh, you know, a, a direct reference to the Rodowski exposition. And so something going on in, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this world uh, in that direction and forcing a little bit, you know, uh, what I'm saying also, and in this case, we are in a really mainstream uh, in terms of cultural because we are colas, we are this research made by Amo, Colas, and Harvard in the Guggenheim. So <laughs> we are really in, a, in, the, in the top. And, um, and they just are wondering something that I think that is quite interesting question. No? We are sure that we, are, we want to live and be in this kind of situation. Okay, that could be a kind of absolute, no? surrealistic situation. So probably, uh, as I know that uh, when I talk about uh, we should as architects uh, pushing in the direction of vernacular architecture, my colleagues see me watch me like uh, you are crazy. And uh, so maybe we can start from countryside, from again more empty, you know the 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 town, the, the city, environmental, but maybe from the countryside. And let me show some projects that we did in more in a European context. This is in Albania, which is uh, um, still uh, you know, uh, um, European. And we just uh, invent some, uh, you know, bringing in the contemporary the vernacular techniques and vernacular materials you know we build some facade in this case we build we call it experimental facade we just build one whole facade with reese river reese take it for free 
straw, clay, and lime. And we get uh, a quite, uh, these are the, the frame, we, we work in a modular way, and this is the, the facade, but I'm not, you know, you are not technicians, so I just go down, and this is the facade. So we get a, a very performing facade with very low budget, and, uh, you know, I think with a, a quite interesting also aesthetic effect, okay, which it became, this is a urban center, and so again, it's a public building, is something that must be iconic in a way and you know um, where the community can recognize itself we are in a very you know um, countryside and so our reference will be the typology the you know the classic typology of the countryside not the the farm and so from the farm we work around it and but we work with the bricks was a material very near by where we build, and so everything was local. We improve jobs that were lose, and so again, our activity try to push uh, uh, economical, social, and cultural uh, environmental. And this is and this is another. This is a Padiglio work in, made in Milan in the exposition of um, Nexpo. Uh, 20, uh, 2015, and uh, this is the idea to show how we can reuse the coffee grounds, and we work with Lavazza, that I think that you know, and uh, Novamont, which is a uh, um, leader to buy bio, bioplastic uh, um, research. So we define just a low-tech way to different uh, environmental. Uh, and we do it in a very, very, you know, low-tech way. This is a, 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 a greenhouse to make grow up the coffee, coffee plants. And this is a place where mushrooms grow up. Because from the, the coffee grounds, we can grow, make grow up a, a mushroom that you can eat. And so, I mean, just in a simple way, we build two different climates in the same building to show that with very low tech tools, but with a huge smartness, you can, you can design something that get very, very different climate. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint and really hope that I don't knock this water bottle onto the laptop. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. I'm glad we could make this happen this week after all. Um, and I'm going to be sharing an abbreviated version of the chapter of my dissertation that I'm currently working on, um, which examines the reception of Augustan algae in an epitaph from the early Roman Empire. So before we get to the epitaph itself, I'm going to be giving you a little introduction to Roman algae and its cast of characters. So the phrase Roman algae or Augustan algae, you'll hear me use both describes a very specific and short-lived phase in the production of algae at the chakra. Roman algae was written during the Augustan period in Rome, which means the period during which the first emperor, Augustus, was in control. It was composed for a maximum of 50 years, but that's usually thought to have been more like 25 to 30, and that time frame goes from when Gallus, our first Roman algist, was composing in the 40s BCE to the death of Ovid, the final Augustan elegist in 17 CE. And so four major poets make up our Augustan can uh, Elgiac canon. We've got Gallus, Propertius, Tibullus, and Ovid. And Gallus here is in parentheses because almost all of his poetry is lost. And as for what constitutes an Augustan elegy, it's mainly defined by its meter, which are elegiac couplets, and by the kind of subject matter that's framed as proper to that meter. And so what is framed as proper to that meter? 
is broadly speaking extramarital affairs in the Augustan period specifically. These affairs are narrated by a first person male speaker and he uses the same name as the Algist. So the speaker in Propertius's poems, for example, calls himself Propertius, but he is partially fictional. And so I'll be calling this character the lover poet moving forward. The lover poet is pursuing a woman who's usually called the Docta Quella, and Docta Quella translates to learned girl. So Docta, same form as doctor, right? And Quella is girl. Um, and so that's her sort of normal title, but the elegist also will often call her his domina, which is a word that I want to pause on because it is pretty shocking in the context of erotic poetry. So in Latin, domina is a woman who owns enslaved people. And it's not a word that's generally used in a sexual or romantic sense outside of Roman elegy. And this is part of a larger trope in elegy that's called the Servitium Amoris, which translates to the slavery of love, where the lover poets refer to themselves as slaves and their love interests as their masters. And because the lover poet is an elite man, and as we're going to see, the learned girl is much lower status, the slavery of love trope is part of elegy's larger interest in reversing normal social and gender roles in Roman society. So the reason I pause on this is that in English, domina is usually translated as mistress, um, but that word is so normal in sexual contexts that I think it really obscures the shock that domina has in erotic poetry. And that's why I always translate it as master, which preserves this surprise of seeing the learned girl as the enslaver and in the position of power, the elder says. So these affairs that LG is recounting between the lover poet and the learned girl are usually not going very well. <laughs> and part of the reason for that are these next two characters that we're going to talk about. So the first of these is the weird, which can be translated either as man, just generally a man, or specifically as a husband. And similar to the weird is the dues amator, and that's translated as the rich lover. So both of these characters are going to play a similar role in the narrative, which is that they keep the learned girl away from the lover poet. And we're going to talk about how and why they do that in a little bit. But for now, we're turning back to the learned girl. So the elegists each have a different name for their love interest. Gallus calls her Lycoris, Propertius calls her Cynthia, Sibelis has Delia, and Ovid has Corona. And these names are all references either to cult titles of Apollo, who's our god of poetry, or to uh, like female poets from Greece. So we can feel pretty confident that these are pseudonyms. Uh, and in fact, most critics are, are in agreement now that these women were not real people and that the love affairs that are being recounted in Augusta analogy are not things that actually happened. And so one of the reasons that this is coming to be accepted among critics, is that the elegists seem instead to have adopted stock situations and characters from a kind of ancient theater called New Comedy, which they're then retelling in this new elegiac form. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to really get into the connections between New Comedy and Elegy. For right now, the most important takeaway is that The Learned Girl is based on a character from New Comedy called the Independent Memoratrix. And the independent narratrix is a sex worker who has her own house, her own property, and her own enslaved servants. And the learned girl's career as a sex worker is what creates the central conflict of her analogy. Basically, the lover poet wants to sleep with her, but he also doesn't want to pay her in anything other than poetry. The learned girl obviously needs money to sustain her household. Um, and also because she's going to get older and won't be able to be a sex worker forever. And so she often refuses the lover poet in order to sleep with clients who will actually pay her. And that's typically going to be the weird or the rich lover that I mentioned on the last slide. And because of this framework for comedy, although, as I said, the word weird can be husband, it most likely in the context of elegy is referring to a client who has some kind of long-standing agreement or contract with the learned girl. 
and this contract gives him special access to her, or maybe requires her to live with him for certain periods. All right, so she has to refuse him for her livelihood sometimes, but the learning girl's refusal is also necessary to elegy as a genre. So although it occasionally recounts a happy night together, Augustine Elegy mostly frames itself as attempts to persuade the learned girl to sleep with the lover poet. And so she provides both the occasion and the ideal audience for the poems. So she has to refuse so that the poet has a reason to keep writing poetry to try to persuade her. And she also has to be learned so that she can understand and potentially be persuaded by this very learned poetry. Okay, so to sum up before we move on to this epitaph, we're focusing on three major characters from Against an Elegy tonight. We have our narrator, the lover poet, our love interest, the learned girl, and then we have a rival figure in the weird and rich lover who can be sort of mashed together. Okay, so this is the epitaph that I'm going to be talking tonight, uh, talking about tonight. It's called CIL uh, 6.5302, so catchy. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be calling it the Draco epitaph instead for reasons that are hopefully going to be clear soon. And this is a picture of the Draco epitaph that was taken in 2014 inside the collective burial structure where it's still in place. And before we take a look at a translation of the epitaph, I do want to point out a few things about the way that it looks. So first of all, the text is inscribed very neatly and clearly on a marble slab. It's made up of eight lines of verse, and you can see every other line is indented, and that's a visual cue that it's in elegiac couplets. Although actually, when we look at the text, there are symmetrical irregularities in there. Um, and then the other thing to note is that the eight lines are split in half, so that you've got the first four on one side of the slab and the second four on the next side of the slab. Okay, you might also notice there's nothing else on this slab. So often with verse epitaphs, you'll see a name or an age or both above or below the verse and just like written in prose. This doesn't have any of that, it just has this poem. So let's see what it actually says. Okay, so on this slide, on the left side, you've got a Latin transcription of the Draco at the top. And then on the right side, you've got my translation, which reads, whatever young man reads this epitaph, who has his own dear girl, refrain from binding her arms too much with gold, even though she wraps her arms like snares around your neck and asks that she would bear rewards worthy of her merits. Indulge her with clothing, keep back shining finery. Thus the robber will be far from here and there will be no adulterer. For a showy servant devoured the limbs from my master and gave a penetrating and perpetual wound to her man. Okay, so I think even for people who are not looking at Latin inscriptions all the time, this is pretty clearly a little strange for an epitaph. Um, and the first thing that I want to call your attention to is the fact that there are no names here at all. So it's not that they are put into the poem. There's just no names given for this woman or for the person who's commemorating her. And then just to give you guys a sense of how strange that epitaph really is, um, these are two more average inscriptions that were found in the same collective burial structure. And actually, the second one is like right above the Draco epitaph. Um, and so the first of these two inscriptions reads, Cornificia Kipare lived for three years and 10 months. So it's a commemoration for a little girl, gives her name and her age. And the second one is for two women, and it reads, Julia Prima of Eunice, mother of Phoebe, Phoebe of Fronto, lived for 18 years. So in general, what the sense I want you to get from these is typically we are going to see a name, typically we're going to see a much shorter inscription, uh, and to, you know, if we get biographical information, it's going to be something like age, maybe family relationship, sometimes if we're lucky, maybe a job. So this Draco poem, very unusual. Okay. So the second thing that I want to draw your attention to in the Draco epitaph is this word domina, which we were just discussing as another kind of word for the learned girl. And now I'm going to take us through two different ways of reading this poem. The first reading is going to situate it 
as an elegy, so as a poem that engages really clearly with the tropes and language of Augustan elegy. The second reading is going to consider it in the context of the collective funeral monument where it was found. All right, so the first four lines here, they're quite strange uh, as the start of an epitaph, right? It's basically dating advice, um, but they do read very much like a normal elegiac poem. So they set the speaker up as a man who is experienced in love and he's giving dating advice to other men. And this is a pose adopted often enough by the Roman elegists that it has its own name. It's called the Praetor Amoris, which translates to the teacher of love. And this teacher of love stance appears throughout Augustan elegy, but it's best exemplified by Ovid's Ars Auditoria, which is just three straight books of dating advice in elegiac verse. <laughs> um, I love this book, but anyway, that's a topic for another time. Um, so the generalizing opening of the Draco at the top even sort of maps on to the opening of the Ars Auditoria. So the Draco epitaph starts, whatever young man reads this epitaph, who has his own dear girl, instructions. Ovid's going to start the Ars Auditoria. Whoever in this people does not know the art of loving, let him read this. So we get this general call and like, get ready, I'm going to give you advice. And then the advice that the speaker of the Draco epitaph offers is also very typical of elegy. So Ovid explicitly tells men not to give their lovers expensive gifts in the Ars Auditoria. And this advice reflects a larger complaint that the, the lover poets of elegy often have about the women girl, which is that she's always asking for gifts. Or actually, she's probably more politely asking for payment, but they usually call them gifts. So complaints about the learning girl's greediness appear throughout Propertius, Wallace, and Ovid. And they're often connected to more general musing about the evils of luxury or how the learned girl's too busy with her rich lover pay attention to the poet. And one of the clearest examples of this kind of complaint appears in Amores 110, where Ovid says that he used to love Corna more than anything, but now he's undergone a change of heart. And he writes, You ask why I have changed? Because you demand gifts. That's the reason that keeps you from pleasing. While you were simple, I loved your spirit along with your body. Now your beauty is injured by your mind's defect. So these first four lines of the Draco at this half do read very much like a normal allergy, in which we've got this speaker of love stance and this advice, don't ask for gifts, don't give your girlfriend gifts. Okay, before we move on to lines five through eight, I just want to come back again to the appearance of the epitaph and what the experience of someone reading it for the first time on stone might have been. So, right, you've got these first four, not going to get too far from my book, first four normal elegiac lines. And then you get a very clear visual break at the end of those first four lines where you're going to have to move your gaze over from the left, back up, and to the right. And that visual break coincides really nicely with a break in the meaning of the poem as well. And this is going to become clear in the first two words of line five, where the speaker advises, indulge her with clothes. This runs counter to the usual behavior of the lover poet, who claims that he can't afford to give the learned girl anything other than poetry. And fancy clothes are actually one of the luxuries that Propertius specifically says that his learned girl should stop asking for and stop wearing in the second elegy of his first book. So from Westy to and Dulge, we already had a hint that the speaker of the Draco epitaph is not the usual lover poet, but somebody who has a little more money. And in the context of Augustan elegy, that's going to be the weir or the rich lover that we were just talking about. So this suggestion is strengthened by the speaker referring to himself as weir in that final line. Um, and also by his concern about adulterers. So the lover poet also worries about the learned girl's fidelity all the time, but she's depicted as constantly cheating on her weird with the lover poet himself. And in fact, some of the advice that he's going to give is actually aimed at teaching her, you know, how she can secretly communicate with him at dinner parties where the weir and he are both present, how she can sneak out of the weir's house quietly so she can go see him at night. So this concern about adulterers, the weir should be worried. Okay, so reading this epitaph as a poem 
we find that the first four lines set the audience up to believe that they're reading a normal algae. And then he turned whoever this speaker is turns the tables in the fifth line and shows the reader that he's actually the wealthy rival. So this doesn't explain all of the oddities of the poem. So I want to move our attention now over to this showy serpent. So previous scholars have interpreted this Draco as a golden bracelet in the shape of a snake that scratched the woman. And in this reading, uh, you know, the scratch got infected, there were no antibiotics, and she died. So snake bracelets were fairly common in antiquity. So this reading is not impossible, but I do find it pretty unconvincing. First of all, because it does force you to assume a lot that's not actually in the narrative of the poem, right? There's no mention of her being scratched. There's no mention of her being sick. And, and then secondly, because it doesn't account for this word nam, which is in line seven and is translated as four. So that word creates a causal relationship between the robber and the adulterer and the death of the domina. And so this, that doesn't make sense if the Draco is actually a bracelet. So I'm going to suggest a new reading of those last two lines and interpret that showy serpent not as a snake bracelet, but instead as a manifestation of the evil eye. All right, so the evil eye and magic in general were an accepted part of daily life for the ancient Romans and also the Greeks. Traces of the evil eye appear in archaeological finds from Rome, like this mosaic uh, from the Basilica Hilariana, which I saw at the Centrale Monte Martini and might still be there. Um, and we also find protective magical amulet, uh, objects like amulets. We'll also see uh, the evil eye appearing in ancient literature. And these traces show us that people of all statuses believed in the evil eye, and they also sometimes offer us explanations about how its malevolent power so broadly speaking, the evil eye is a facet of ancient theories explaining vision, which often explain our sense of sight as physical and tactile. In many ancient theories of vision, the eyes were believed to produce rays or emanations that struck visible objects, allowing us to see them. These rays were believed to be powerful and potentially dangerous, depending on the person looking's internal state. In particular, it was believed that emanations from an envious person's eyes could penetrate and injure others, making them ill and even causing them to die. The envious person might inflict the evil eye on others on purpose, but could also do it by accident. And there are stories about people accidentally evil eyeing themselves and then dying. <laughs> So essentially, if you attracted too much notice to yourself by being young and beautiful, for example, by being a baby, by getting married, you could also catch the attention of someone with the evil eye and be hurt by it. So certain animals, uh, especially wolves and birds of prey, were also believed to be able to inflict the evil eye. And importantly for this, you know, my purposes tonight, snakes in particular were associated with it was believed that they could cast the evil eye, and the evil eye was also, was also often compared to their poisonous breath. Um, so poisonous emanations from the mouth and from the eyes seen as connected. And then we get monstrous figures like Medusa or the Gorgon or the Basilisk. All of those guys have sneaky attributes, and they often get connected to the evil eye as well because of their power to kill people with their eyes. So let's re-examine this Draco speciosis in light of the background of the evil eye. Loosely, the logic of these four final lines is that young men should give the women they're interested in nice clothes instead of jewelry, because the jewelry might attract unwanted attention. And as evidence, the speaker tells this story about his own domina, who was devoured by the Draco speciosis. So speciosis, I've left it in my translation as showy, which is how it's usually translated. It's an adjective created by adding the ending osis, which means full of, to the noun speciates, which can mean a few different things, all having to do with vision. So it can mean beauty, so something that attracts the eye, and that's what gives us the showy translation, but it can also mean an act of looking or a gaze. And so following Dylan Bobe's translation, thanks Dylan, um, we can also take speciosis as full of glances or full of looks. So if we take that reading, the woman commemorated by this epitaph 
attracted attention because of the jewelry the speaker had given her. That attention then led to her death at the hands of a snake, an animal with strong associations to the evil eye, who is described as full of glances. And so the effects of the snake's gaze are then described with the word infixum, which also has its own connections to magic. It comes from the verb infigo, which can refer to penetrating someone with a weapon, much like the rays from somebody with the evil eye's gaze are imagined to penetrate victims or to concentrating your mind or eyes on something. And it's also formed from the same uh, base as the verb defigo, which literally means to bewitch and shows up in a lot of magical contexts. So taken together, I argue all of these elements indicate that the domina in this epitaph was not killed by a bracelet shaped like a snake, but by an evil eye. And given the connection uh, that the word nam before makes between the robber and the adulterer and the snake, I also argue that the showy serpent is a person wielding the evil eye, not a literal snake. So this could be someone who was jealous of the jewelry that the domino was getting from the speaker, or it could be somebody who was jealous of the relationship between the domino and the speaker. So that could be a potential, a potential adulterer. Okay. So to sum up before moving on to the next part of the talk, I've just offered a reading of this epitaph that interprets it in the framework of a best analogy. Reading it that way shows the literary tone of the epitaph, which engages with tropes and language common to erotic elegy. And it also demonstrates some of its strangeness, like giving dating advice on someone's tombstone, not common now, also not common in the Roman world, um, and it also offered a new interpretation of the final two lines, reading the cause of death for this woman as the evil eye instead of the snake bracelet. Moving on to physical context, um, what I've been doing over the past few weeks is working to situate this epitaph in its physical context in the, you know, the grave site where it was found. So it was found in a collected burial structure called a columbarium, which literally means dove coat in Latin. So somewhere where doves were like living so that they could breed in pairs. And a columbarium is a collected funerary monument with a series of niches on the walls. So this is me standing in one of the columbaria in the necropolis in Ostia. Um, most columbaria are under, well, some columbaria are underground, like the one that the Dracos Spegiosis was in. This one is above ground. We can talk about why that is later. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, and most of those underground ones were being built in the Julio Claudian period, so the beginning of the Roman Empire, right around the time that Augustine elegy actually is being written. So, to take a closer look at these niches, the niches in the walls of Columbaria had urns sunken into the base, and so you can see from this close up what I mean by sunken in, right? Um, and most columbaria were like this one in Ostia. They had two urns at the base, um, but you could find columbaria with as many as six urns. Um, and these urns were intended to hold cremated remains of people. Sometimes you get only one person in an urn, and sometimes you'll see multiple people in one urn. And so the walls of the columbaria were typically covered in, uh, in plaster and painted. Um, these ones are from the larger columbarium in the Villa Pamphili, and they're on display now in the Palazzo Massimo. Um, and most people would have painted the names of the deceased onto those spots that are painted onto the plaster. So if you look carefully over on the right side, you can see some red in those things. That used to be somebody's name. Um, but if you had a little more money to spend and you wanted to be a little fancier, you could be like the person who set up the Draco epitaph and have something inscribed on marble and put where that sort of painted slab is. Okay, so coming to where this epitaph was found, um, it was this columbarium where the Draco epitaph was found is called the Yacodini uh, Three. Uh, it's called that because it was the third columbarium found in a vineyard that uh, still belongs to the Codini family and did belong to them in 1852 when this columbarium was discovered. It's a large columbarium. It's built to hold around 950 people. And its main period of use seems to have been the early Roman Empire. 
So somewhere, but well, actually continuously between Tiberius and Caligula is where we think it's mostly being used. And also from its decoration and design, we can guess that the people being buried in it were a bit wealthier than your average person being buried in a columbarium. So these are some pictures of the interior of the Yacoutini 3. Unfortunately, because it's on private property, it's really hard to get in there. Um, but you can tell from these pictures that there's a lot of marble decoration around the niches. That's one of the things that tells us that these people probably had more money than others being buried in this kind of structure. You can also see that there are marble urns in some of those niches. These are some pictures of the, well, some pictures of some urns that were found in the Yacoutini 3. Um, and you can see they're very ornate, right? They're made of marble. They would have been expensive. These and those marble decorations around the niches are what tell us this fairly wealthy people are using this burial site. Okay, so who are these fairly wealthy people? We can tell from reading their epitaphs that many of them, I'd say probably more than half, were enslaved or freed people who had belonged to the imperial family. In modern scholarship, this group of people is usually called the Familia Caesaris, and in many cases, their lives seem to have been quite different than those of other enslaved people in the Roman world. And that's not to say that they didn't experience the same kind of brutality that other enslaved people did. Um, they almost certainly did, but it is to say that they were involved in the, the governance and the administration of the empire. Uh, they also could be quite rich. So ask me about an epitaph for a man named Musippus from the same columbarium, if you want to hear more about that. Uh, and they also seem to have had some kind of special status once free. We can tell that because freedmen from the familia Caesaris seem to have been a lot more likely than other freedmen to marry freeborn women. So that's why we have this. So Dorian Morbonus has pointed out that the interiors of the Columbaria reflect the collective design of the people who set up that task and commemoration to them. And by that I mean that each time you buried someone in the Columbaria, you had to fit their funeral decorations into the other decorations in this collective space. They also were enclosed, and being a Cody 3, like many other Columbaria, is literally underground. So they're only normally going to be entered by people who either are related to or have some other kind of relationship to the people buried there. And that means that the audience for these funeral decorations is much more limited than other, you know, other more public funeral decorations. Thinking of like the big pyramid of Cepheus that I'm sure you guys have seen in Rome. Okay, so in light of that, I'm currently trying to fit the Draco at the top into the rest of the commemorations in the Yacoutini. So one thing that I've been thinking about is that many of the other epitaphs in this columbarium specify that they were set up by an enslaved or free person for another enslaved or free person. Um, and so it seems very likely that the woman who's commemorated in the Draco epitaph <coughs> was enslaved at some point. And then I think that, first of all, because of this burial context, and second of all, because of the way she's talked about in the epitaph. Um, and it also seems possible that the speaker was enslaved or free. And this lends a very different tone to the word domina or master than it would have had in the mouths of the freeborn Roman elegists, right? So the next thing is that this woman was buried in one of the lower rows of niches, which means that her epitaph was in a really visible spot in the columnar. So it wasn't higher up in an area where you would have had to climb stairs to see it. People would have very easily been able to spot it. Um, and someone put a lot of effort into it. It's quite long. It's quite literary. Someone took time to compose it. Somebody took a not insignificant amount of money to have it inscribed. Why did they do that? So looking at the other 140 epitaphs in there, that took me a long time to make an Excel spreadsheet for, uh, I found quite a few that highlight the literacy either of the person commemorated or of the person who set up the inscription. So there are two other poems in this columbarium. There are six people who worked in Rome's public libraries. There's one record keeper, and there are three secretaries who took vacation. So right now I'm thinking about whether or not we can think about this as evidence of sort of an atmosphere of literary competition in this columbarium, 
or of literary competition as one of the collective design features for this columbarium. And if that's the case, this Draco epitaph, which is imitating Augustine elegy, would fit right in, right? So that's sort of what I'm thinking through. And to wrap up, oh, don't want to get to my bibliography just yet. To wrap up, I want to fit this uh, chapter back into the full dissertation project. So my full dissertation is examining the reception of Augustine elegy in three pretty disparate case studies. So the earliest one are these epitaphs from sort of the first through second, or this, yeah, 100 through 200 CE. Then I jump into late antiquity to look at the six elegies of Maximianus, which are still in Latin. And then I'm gonna jump about a thousand years to Louise Labbe and jump into French uh, to take a look at her elegy. And in each of these cases, what I'm really interested in looking at is how changing the identity of the elegiac speaker allows people to rework the conventions of the genre and then use them to work through the issues they're dealing with in their own time. So this isn't some sort of, these are not like slavish reproductions, bad word choice there, but you know, they're not these reproductions of Augustine elegy that don't change anything. They're really working with the genre to make something new. Um, and so the point of my project is not only to highlight things like the Draco epitaph that haven't received a lot of consideration, but it's also to show the enduring power of elegy as a tool for people to navigate issues of identity and duty in moments of great change. So Augustine elegy was created by elite men to make sense of their changing status and obligations as Rome shifted from republic to empire. But my case studies show that elegy is malleable and it remains a useful tool for anyone who's confronting the fallout of a significant change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Grace and Alessia. Two wonderful talks. Let's uh, dive into questions. Jessica. Um, thank you both uh, for these very passionate subjects. Um, I was curious uh, about Alessio's connection to the community when you say we, we came to the Gaza Strip. Are you talking about your company, for example? Uh, and how did the people who needed you so badly to come help them rebuild or build a school or whatever, um, find you? And how was that facilitated? Because that, to me, is so intriguing. Um, how to make those connections? Yeah, we usually work with NGO that mm -hmm. are on, on the field. And so we, or we participate some call, usually UN, some agency of UN, or we work a lot with Italian uh, government uh, and uh, French and Belgium and you know there are usually there are some calls and we we just propose some way they asking for you know we have to build a, a school and uh, in this case they ask us to um, try to define a, a innovative schools to rebuild the school system in Mosul which now is totally destroyed and so in this case it was a UNESCO call. So UNESCO is an agency, a UN mm -hmm. agency. And so we just uh, define a project, you know, I mean, how we are going to develop it in terms of education. We work with pedagogies and uh, in terms of architecture, because we stress a lot the sustainability and the symbolic idea, no? Rebuild, and so that was a uh, uh, winning. I don't know how can I say it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we we won it, and so we started to work on it. We were on the place where where just arrived, where was still the land mill on the field, you know. So we are you know moving on uh, on, on the plot uh, in a very you know carefully way. <laughs> And the bombs everywhere, and so now, now we are. I mean, if you want, I can show the one little uh, survey just to make clearest uh, what 
we are talking about uh, I mean now is uh, now is uh, in a in a good situation huh? in a good uh, mm -hmm. in a better uh, let me this is our our plot unfortunately we have to use a lot of concrete now because you know we are in the middle of two hills in a way but uh, look uh, they starting to fix something but it was totally destroyed look around and again we are in historical center so so unesco are trying to rebuild it everything i think organizing it in a very bad way but this is my my opinion and uh, look that is all the stuff yeah so and basically ngo we participate together mm -hmm. or directly to some uh, un agency and a quick question that's connected to this question and then i would leave room for someone else um have you always done this kind of work is that what your architecture mission is about Sorry, Jackie. Somebody's crowned. No, have thank you and your organization because the people, the architecture, the commission. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, no, just uh, just uh, finished my degree. I work in Milan, you know, in a fancy studio. Then uh, very very soon I start. I mean, we we did the first school uh, in these places uh, in a uh, two. 2008, but before I were working in South America, mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, okay. in something like, like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much. Alessia, I'm going to pick you up with just the fantastic two questions. Um, I really, what I appreciated most, like a complex sandwich, what I appreciated most uh, was uh, well, the work that you do is really impressive and phenomenal in scope, and also how you were talking about um, the section on climate change. I wish we had more time, all right? I think a lot about crisis um, as a turning point and, and one that you sort of marked with a definitely different sort of lens. My question, because now I know that you're working with NGOs, et cetera, I'm not sure if it's a question you can answer and I am willing to translate, but with deep respect for your work, I'm wondering what you and your company and other architects and NGOs even who go into this place specifically into Palestine think about the question of sustainability when as you've mentioned things are constantly reduced to rubble so how is it what language do you as architects give right to the aesthetics of sustainability if as you say you build something with the sort of inevitability of its demise and being reduced to rubble to only go back and build again Ms. Diego yeah, she, until the last sentence. Yeah, well, that's the whole point. I kind of got there at the end, Alessio. So I'm wondering because you're talking to us about sustainability, and then you gave us these really shocking sorts of numbers and thinking about climate catastrophe, climate crisis, yeah. whatever names we give to it. And on the other hand, you're talking about returning materials, going back to the space. And well, this ah. one you said you were proud of the school that withstood three bombs until the fourth, right? And I'm wondering. When I'm, when I'm listening to you and being so moved by the work that you all are doing, I'm like, well, that's not sustainable, is it? That's just sort of a matter of endurance. And as you've given us the numbers, we don't really have time to endure, right? Yeah. It's not a waiting game for all of us in the same way. So I'm wondering, do you speak from the position of the person, the people, the company who are building these things? Is there something that your company or, the, I don't know, the team of architects, it's not my field at all, obviously, do to say, well, we're sustainable. This is a sustainable piece of wood, but the sustainable sustainable piece of wood that makes the unsustainable bomb will beget another sustainable piece of wood. You know what I'm saying? Is there a way to sort of yeah, intervene no, rather yeah. than going back to rebuild and also take resources to do that? That you can talk to yeah, but the people that you talk to with all the UN people that you've mentioned. Yeah, if I get you, the alternative is uh, don't build a new school. Did you? Uh, yeah, no, okay. yeah, otherwise uh, the, the children that don't have any more any another school. Mm -hmm. So we are the point is we, we, we work with the community as I as I say, and we try to define 
the material that are more sustainable for this peculiar place mm -hmm. then of course if you rebuild in the same place in the same way um, maybe we are going to lose land or uh, or you know i don't know if this is the point but uh, we are building you know a new uh, we try to give back the function the function that is very important for this peculiar community mm -hmm. okay I see Marla hovering. Mm -hmm. Thank you see so much. Sure I can't it's wait. A, I, I think it's a great up. question. You guys I should definitely. It's such a big one. Mm -hmm. yeah. The dinner definitely talk mm -hmm. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I have a question for Grace, but but I'd like to say thank you for these two wonderful papers and that share this thread of site specificity that I wasn't expecting. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what it was like to visit Mario. <laughs> What was the extent of the light? Were you reading these by torchlight? How might that affect the experience? And then I guess a sort of follow-up question is, was there a circulation of these inscriptions outside of the context of the so site itself? So were people trading that and, and talking about this as a genre outside of the site itself? Those are two really great questions. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't been able to be in any underground columbaria yet, uh, but I have been bothering Sophia about it nonstop, but uh, it's just unfortunately because being a Code 3 is on private property and then others are like under restoration for water damage, it looks like I won't be physically in one until January at the earliest. Uh, the one that I visited in Ostia was above ground and the top of the roof of it is gone. So the lighting in there is very good, um, but <laughs> probably not what it would have been in antiquity. Um, so I'm looking forward to in the future being able to say more about that first question. As to the second one, I haven't seen the inscriptions that I work on in any of the collections that were circulated. But we do have collections of epigrams, um, like the Greek anthology or the Palatine anthology, that do collect epigrams that some of them seem to have been real inscriptions that were then collected into these books of poetry. And then some of them are like fake inscriptions that are sort of ripping off the real ones. So it's not impossible that people could have collected things like the Draco epitaph, but I've never seen that one or any of the other ones that I work on in the dissertation collected in that way. But I think they're definitely interacting with the ones that were collected, if that makes sense. Should we take one more before dinner? Do we have any on Zoom? Yeah. Oh. oh, yes, in fact, John. We've had, you know, oh, Pierre. Hi. Oh, who was? Oh, John. Pierre, we, we, we have time for two. Pierre and John. Okay. This will be a little rambling. We've had rooftop conversations about how persistent that, you know, yes, lighting is from the ideology of, you know, I want this, but I want, don't want to pay for it and devaluing certain labor. So just wondering if your uh, research or your writing will extend to the present, even to the people making the laws that uh, still devalue certain labor or um, still try to limit the body, the female, the woman, the female body and reproduction? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think I do want to extend my research into contemporary receptions of elegy. I think the relationship between elegy and sex work is really complicated because the, the Augustan elegists never come right out and say, you know, you're a sex worker, you're a prostitute, and I'm trying to not pay you. They're just sort of the way that they interact with the framework from new comedy is like under the surface. And so they're always framing the girl as not asking for payment that she's due, but is asking for a gift or something like that that takes it out of this commercial context, even though from the rest of it, we can tell that that's what's actually going on. So it becomes tricky to talk about. It also becomes tricky because ancient sex work is a huge topic and there were a lot of different kinds of ancient sex workers. So there were people who had more money than others, people who had more control than others. 
and it's not really my wheelhouse, it's actually more Sarah's wheelhouse. Um, so I would love to do that sometime in the future, but I would have to become more of a historian and less of a literary person to do it, if that makes sense, or to do it in a responsible way. John? Cool. Yeah, thank you both for these uh, really, really fascinating talks. Uh, my question is also for, for Grace. Uh, a question and a brief comment. Uh, could you just say briefly what the subjects of the other two um, poetic inscriptions are? Uh, and, uh, and and the comment was, um, do you think that looking at the poems of Idris, who I mean, debated may or may not be an imperial freedman, um, could be a could be like a helpful comparative um, lens for for this columbarium? Because I think I'm not sure about this, but. I think that some of uh, Peter's poems are dedicated, or the books dedicated to other imperial freedmen. Um, so perhaps a similar sort of social view. Yeah, definitely. I have, I actually can pull up those two other poems. Um, as for the Peter's comment, that's a great one, John, and I'm going to have to look into him more. He's not an author that I've spent a lot of time with, but that does sound like he would be a really great comparative source here. Where are you? Here we go. So the other two are a little bit more like normal in terms of funerary inscriptions. So we get one in iambic that's over this way. Here lies Julia Erotis, the best wife. I carry no pain to the underworld with me. I pleased my husband and patron and I died first. So she gets her name in there. Pretty standard praise. This other one is also an elegiac couplet. It's very, actually very fun with this poem. Um, and it's it comes with four different names. So it says, if any woman misses her husband, and if any very miserable woman laments her brother snatched away and lost a son from her lap, let her look at this epitaph. She will not fail to find there the mournful death for which she grieves, and she will weep more for my so great losses. So the names that are on this epitaph are the names of the brother, the husband, and the son that this is for, and of the woman commemorating them. So even though we get sort of similar things going on in terms of like meter, uh, obviously the subject matter is super different and the biographical information is super different. Wow. Well, with that, with that a huge thank you to both of you. We'll continue the conversation at dinner.